Monday morning quarterback, NorthJerseySports.com's original multimedia series talking all things North Jersey football, and we got a lot of talk to talk about this week because it is playoff time, baby. They are officially underway as the quarterfinals were played last weekend. The semifinals will be played this weekend. We are a little late coming to you this week because of the continuing season of technological discontent that I have been experiencing here at the NorthJerseySports.com world headquarters. But all that being said, I am Corey Doviak, being joined by my illustrious panel of experts, starting with our guy, Jimmy Avatabale. Jimmy, what's going on? Not yeah, much, Corey. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. And I know you are a football guy, so you had to be enjoying yourself this past weekend. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the best time of the year by far. Even with this weather now? It's uh, it's Northeast football. It's Big Ten weather. <laughs> Here we go. Also being joined by Brandon Gregory. What's going on, Brent? Hey, buddy. How are you? I'm doing fine. And, and Brandon, you're recreating a scene uh, from a few years ago. Our friend Chris Gaskin, the Richfield Park head basketball coach, one time did a uh, guest appearance on a show with us from in a snowbank somewhere in Ridgefield Park. His car got stuck in the snow, and rather than miss his appearance, he just got in the car, turned the heat on, and got on the cell phone. Where are you, Brandon? Well, I'm actually sitting at, I think, uh, Tom, no, Benjamin Franklin School in Teaneck. My daughter has basketball practice, and I forgot that I was doing the show tonight, so I said, you know something, i got to sit out here, out in this car, and do this uh, show tonight. So that's where I'm at right now. My daughter's inside. People asking me how to get into the gym. I'm just sitting here trying to do what i got to do here. Well, we, we love your uh, stick-to-itiveness, absolutely. And I'm the a- third member of our panel, our very own NorthJerseySports.com football insider, Richie Ballgame Barton. What's up, Richie B? Not much. Just uh, ready to listen to some interviews, talk some football, and uh, enjoy the night. Did you say interviews? That's right. We got some because uh, our guys were out and about. Brandon Gregory got us a great sound with DJ Nymphius, the Riverdale head coach, whose team advanced in North 1 Group 3, headed back to Franklin Lakes for a semifinal showdown this week with the Rampo Green Raiders. And that one's definitely going to be interesting to listen to because DJ, as he always does, touches on a lot of great topics uh, that don't necessarily always include just the action on the field. We will also have sound from the Paramus game where we double teamed it as Brian Carr sent in an interview with Bryce Jacob and Brandon got us an interview with Dan Sabella. But before we get to all that, Richie B., I know that you have been hard at work in preparation for your return to the Monday morning quarterback. So what do you got numbers-wise for us? Well, you know, when I was looking at things, I was looking more at competitive balance because as I saw the scores roll in, It just seemed like one blowout after another, after another, after another. We need the five five brackets, right? We need five brackets, all full. (laughs) That's, I mean, we could we could go on for hours between that, the four parochial groups instead of two. Uh, I mean, there's there, you know, playing down to a state champ. We could go on for a, a long time about that. But I was looking at specifically the matchups between the one and eight seeds, two and seven seeds. And the three and six seeds. And when I crunched the numbers, uh, I looked at the four non-public sections, the five sections in North 1 and North 2 Group 2 being that we have two teams in there, Lincoln and Richfield Park. And when I crunched the numbers, it was pretty, <laughs> pretty interesting to say the least. Um, First of all, for all this preparation. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. I, I blush very easily. Um, so, okay, there were 27 of those games in North Jersey played this weekend. Out of those 27 games, only one of the six, seven, and eight seeds actually won the game. That was Immaculata over Hudson Catholic. And while I love my boy Lou Zantella, the head coach over there, doing a great job, Immaculata is a, you know, a, a pretty good program, and I wouldn't call that a giant upset. Right. In those 27 games, <laughs> only four of them were were even competitive where the lower-seeded team held a lead at any point in the game. Eesh. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, listen, the numbers get better. Um, <laughs> out of those, to all you underdogs out there, I say. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. Um, out of those 27 games, the higher-seeded team scored at least 31 points in 25 of those 27 games. That means in 92.6% of those games, the team scored at least 31 points. That's uh, – yeah. Sorry, I found my sound effects folder. Yeah, that's right. Um, and in 63% of those games, 17 out of 27, they scored at least 40. And in 12 out of those 27 games, they allowed 7 or less. I, I mean, now you're talking disparity. In the 3 to 6, in the games between 3 and 6 seeds, the 3 seed outscored the 6 seed uh, by a average of 39.8 to 17.8, which is... You know, uh, not great. It's a pretty big disparity between three and six seeds, but when you look at the two and seven and the one and eight, I mean, my God, the two between games between the two and the seven seed, not one and seven seed ever held a lead. The uh, there was one game that was forty one twenty eight, and then the next closest game was Westwood's thirty one six blowout. <laughs> Right. The average the average Which margin of victory been... was thirty six points in those games. In the one and eight games, uh, the average margin of victory was twenty six points, with the eight seed scoring an average of nine point three points per game. Um, the bottom line is 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 it goes back to the five groups. I mean, you know what what do we do here? Because I, obviously this is a money grab for the NJSIA to you know, get as much revenue as they can, and that's why they have these extra on the playoffs. But All right, that, that, listen, that by you, and you know I don't compliment you often, that is outstanding work by you, and it brings up the issue that I, I didn't know we'd go there, but let's go to Jimmy. Uh, listen, they, they've been talking forever, how do we get it down to a one-state champion? I, I think you start with eliminate the first round of the playoffs. You know, that that's the obvious uh, first step. That cuts a week off right there. But the other side, as Richie brought up, you know, teams pay to play in the postseason. So it's one of those uh, politics versus reality. What do you think, Jimmy? Well, I I think it is 100% right. I think there's a lack of depth in North 1 and and North 2 on the public side of the the ledger. I also think, obviously, parochial football, you have your four or five powers, and then that falls off the table. If you look at Central, the Central section, you had number one seed Hope Well Valley get upset by an under 508 seed in Ocean Township. And you also had in the South section, Camden, on one seed, get knocked out. So I think the depth in Central Jersey and Southern Jersey of the public side of the house is a lot stronger. And, and that comes from the more regional schools in those sections compared to one single town in the, in the north. Yeah, and if you look, Ocean Township playing a Shore conference schedule against Hopewell Valley, which doesn't. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, it, the Shore is competitive week in, week out, and, you know, not knowing much about Ocean Township, but I'm sure if I looked at their schedule, they played A, good teams every week, and B, we're probably in a bunch of them. Yeah, and that Coach Fred Stengel was the offensive coordinator down there. They actually lost their best player two weeks ago with a broken leg, so they were without their best player, still went out there and beat the one seed. Yeah, uh, that's crazy, Brandon. You got anything to add to the to uh, to this? You know, something nothing nothing else needs to be said. They've done a good job, you know, Jimmy and Rich uh, with their homework. And um, there's nothing I need to add on to that. You know, it's, yeah. It's, I mean, Richie Barton yeah, yeah, bringing Rich, it. Richie, I, I can't say any. Rich, Richie, I'm I'm pumping my brakes in my car. That's how good that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rich. I, I mean, I'm flabbergasted. I think I kind of want to end the show right now. I mean, what do you got to say for yourself, Richie B? What what spurred you to this type of uh, deep hitting, penetrating research? Well, you know, just having a couple of conversations with uh, friends of mine that are that are into high school sports, and we were talking about what? you know you know what you know how great it was. You know, I mean, everyone talks about how great everything was back in in their era, but. It was like when you got, you, you know, you could be seven and one, seven to two, eight and one, and not make the playoffs. I mean, that seems a little crazy, but on the flip side, you had to really, really earn it to get in. Uh, I mean, for instance, I mean, I saw uh, Randall Paul Burgerfield this past weekend. Burgerfield, you know, the Hassett's got a couple good athletes. They play hard. Randall Paul was just 
way better. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a competitive game, and it, it, it's it's the question of as a coach, like you know, do you want to go in and take your shot, or I mean, do you want do you want to end your game? Do you want to end your season? You know, with a great Thanksgiving game against a rival, or a consolation game that's competitive, or do you want a shot at at one of the big boys, so to speak, and maybe possibly lose the game forty six to seven or whatever it is. That that's so true. I mean, the Thanksgiving Day rivalry that would, used to be a great way to end the season, win or lose. If you beat your rival, it was a, a successful year. And you know, Brandon, we did a lot on Bergenfield last week, and it was a great story making the state tournament for the first time since 1989. And no one wanted to, you know, pop the proverbial bubble about bringing up the fact that hey, you know, you got extra brackets, and now there's eight in each. But you know, honestly, they went in and what were they four and four, five and four? So. You know, what do you think? Well, I agree with, what, like I said, what, what Jimmy and what you said, you know, what they brought to the table this evening. And a team like Bergenfield, you know, not that they don't have the athletes. They just they just weren't competitively ready to perform at that level against a team like Ramapo. Not behind lack of coaching, but behind the kids understanding what it is to play playoff football. And a lot of times when it's one versus eight, and a lot of times the eight seed, they're just happy just to be there. They're like, we made it, right. and then, the, you know, they're, they're content. And then if their season ends, they're okay with it because they, they can always say, like any 16 and 17 year olds, oh, well, we made the playoffs this year. But really, what what did you get from it? What was the cause, and mainly what was the effect that you get from the game? So, and that's where, you know, things need to be addressed uh, hopefully soon, but I, I doubt very seriously because, you know, like you said... No, it's going the other way. way. I, I, more, more so with the parochials. I don't understand why on earth you would have four parochial groups when there there aren't enough teams to re, even fill out a bracket in some of them. Right. I mean, if you, combine, when yeah, they got it anyway. if you combine one and two, all right, say you combine three and four, we'll say. Say you get, say you get St. Joe's against, uh, Paramus Catholic or Don Bosco or St. Peter's Pep or, or whoever. That's a great final. You, you, you go to one and two yep. and you get St. Joe's Hamilton against Nepal. That's a great final. That's what everyone would want to see. Uh, I, yes. But what the fans want. Well, you know what, though, in high school football, it's not really about what the fans want. It's about what the parents want. And the parents want. And the kids want to play in a state final. So if there's, you know, double the teams in the state final, you're keeping more people happy, as we've talked about. All right. We could talk about this all night. Maybe we will. But let's get into some of the action that happened uh, last weekend before we move forward. And I should mention that with our picks last week, uh, in all of the ones that we picked, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 brackets, we uh, all chose champions. And none of us has yet to lose a champion. So there, there is... First blood has not been spilled yet in the NorthJerseySports.com playoff prediction challenge. So uh, I, where I'm going to start here, I'm going to start in that North 1 group three because we've talked about it a little bit already, and I want to get to that DJ Nymphius in- interview. So let's just run down the scores. Number one, Sparta beat West Milford 33 uh, nothing. Mawa ended Garfield's brilliant season 30-14 to in the 5-4 game. Uh, that was a – by the seeds, that was an upset. Uh, Riverdale – Beat number six, Lodi, 49-14, and as we mentioned, Ramapo uh, took it to Bergenfield, 51-15. to But uh, Riverdale will get a return trip to Franklin Lakes, but our very own Brandon Gregory caught up with Riverdale head coach DJ Nymphius after that win, and this is a good interview. Here it is. This is Brandon Gregory from NorthJerseySports.com on the sideline at the Riverdale's 49-14 win over Lodi. Of Coach DJ Nithias. Coach, you haven't played Lodi since the mid 2000s. Was it difficult getting ready for tonight's game? Uh, we had a little bit of a short week, but uh, you know, I, I think uh, we had plenty of film on them. You know, I've had the good fortune I coached against them for 12 years when I was at Glen Rock, so uh, I think that probably helped us out a little bit. And uh, you know, it was our normal it was our normal practice week. We, we worried more about ourselves than the opponent, and we came out and we gave a relatively good performance. Coach, watching your teams play, watching your team play tonight, they're always well prepared in all three phases of the game. What fundamentals do you and your staff believe in game to game? Well, the game still comes out to being able to align 
to block tackle, pursue the ball. You know, we spent a lot of time this week on block destruction, trying to trying to make sure we came to balance and pursued the ball and redirected because they had some really good players that could run around with the ball. Uh, we really weren't good in all the phases because we gave up a kickoff return for a touchdown, and that's just inexcusable. Uh, and we kicked the ball to the wrong kid who we said we weren't going to kick it to all night, and we kicked it to him every single time tonight. But um, we've got to improve in that manner. But uh, we, we're, we're pretty much, uh, you know, a fundamental football team. I think, I think, Brandon. I think at this time of the year, I think the greater concern has to be has to be your fundamentals and what you do, rather than, you know, schematic things kind of come to you. Your scheme is what you have at this time of the year. It becomes about becomes about players. But for us, and we're going to spend an inordinate amount of time on, on the fundamentals of the game, and that's, you know, that seems to help us a lot. I, I believe that's what the game is all about. With the play of your quarterback, Dylan Collins, being, being such a huge part of the team's success this year, where do you see him at, at this point during the season? And like any head coach, what do you want him to get to improve at moving forward in the playoffs? Dylan prepares so meticulously. Uh, what I always say to him is, Dylan, you got to let the game come to you. There's times when Dylan tries to do more than he needs to do. And he's, he, the game is starting to slow down for him because he's gotten much more comfortable with what he's doing as a quarterback. And uh, I think, I think you know, the kid obviously has tremendous ability. And he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful kid. Uh, he, he's, he's such a hard worker. Uh, and what we expect from him pretty much is what I think every coach expects from a quarterback. Take care of the ball. Uh, make sure he knows what everybody's doing. And uh, go out there and play your tail off. Last question, DJ. How much respect do you have for the coach on the other sideline tonight, Pat Rico? He's led low die for over 30 years, has over 190 wins. How much respect do you have for him, as not so much as a coach, but as you know, just as a person in what he believes in low die football? Well, I, I think there's a few things that we want to look at with that. First of all, Brandon, you're, you 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 coach track, and uh, you know if you look at you look at low die as a school district, the amount of pride those kids have in where they you know where they grew up, which is where Pat grew up. Uh, it, it won't be a good day for Lodi when Pat decides that yeah, that he's had enough and would like to do other things. He's he's a gentleman. He he uh, prepares his kids very well. Uh, the, the the kids believe in him, and he really is. I mean, he 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 is Lodi, you know. And you really respect that in small towns. I mean, let, 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 let's cut to the chase. Uh, his he's got two. His quarterback's pretty good. He's got two really good players over at Burden Catholic. Now we all talk about kids going to other schools, and but you know that's not easy. He had to change his whole whole offense in one summer because his quarterback last year left at the last second, and that's a rough go, you know. And and uh, I think it's pretty good offensively. You know they're always going to be well coached, and uh, you know he gets a great feel for what his kids can and cannot do, and uh, you know I, I have all the respect in the world for him. Thank you, DJ, for a couple of minutes of your time. When DJ Nymphia says, let's cut to the chase, I, like, perked up a little bit because I knew something good was coming. And he cut to the chase, man. That, Brandon, I would tell you what a good job he did, but I, maybe you should tell us. How, how well, do you, you do know, on that? Something, in talking to DJ, you know, I want to become, I want to always be prepared, you know, because I know he's going to come up with some well, well-thought-out well answers. And, you know, in, yes. in starting to understand, you know, North Jersey football and being out on sidelines, I think it's important that sometimes that we talk about the people in these towns like a Pat Tirico and uh, the coaches that stay in these towns for long periods of time to build up these programs and try to make it uh, something that the people in the community can look forward to. And Coach Tirico has been there, like I said, for over 30 years. So Lodi is important to him, and I think those are some of the values that are not being placed out here in today's society, you know. And I think it's, I'm glad DJ said what he did say because Lodi is important to that man, not what the football team brings, but what Lodi, what he knows what Lodi needs. And that's what football is and certain other sports bring to a town. And uh, Pat Tirico speaks volumes as far as what Lodi should be proud of through the years that he's been there. Uh, I second that. Jimmy, your thoughts. You're a, a Lodi a Lodi guy, although not a Lodi High School graduate, but that had to hit you too a little bit. You know Oh that. yeah, you I mean know. growing up in town, you know, when I grew up in the in, in the late seventies and early eighties, Lodi was, was known for baseball and uh the football program struggled year in and year out. Pat was a, was an all county player at Lodi High School, went to college, came 
took the job in 1983 or 84, and, you know, within six or seven years, they had won a state championship. Pat always does a great job. He works at it. And, uh, you know, another good season. He, I think he's close to 200 wins now. Yeah. And, and Richie, you've been in a lot of bars in Lodi. What do you think? <laughs> I have, actually. Um, no, but, uh, but no, no, I know, you know, I know Pat well. He's a good guy, good coach. Uh, again, prepares well. And, uh, I mean, obviously going into the season, yeah, yeah, it's tough for him. I mean, he had a all league quarterback that was dangerous every time he touched the ball. And now all of a sudden he's got it. You know, when you, you you prepare your whole offense mainly around one guy and then that guy's gone, what do you do? And now now you've got to yep. scrap everything that you've prepared for and kind of go in a different direction. And that, uh, you know, no matter how long you're coaching that on any level, that's that's very difficult to do. I agree. And I don't know Pat Tarico. I've met him once or twice, but uh, sounds like a good guy from listening to you guys. So we'll we'll leave it at that. Let's move on. Uh, let's do a, we'll switch to North one group four. That's a competitive bracket as it always is. Well, since it was created here. Uh, and I want to do that only because we got sound from one of the head coaches in that group in Dan Tabella of Paramus, but Jimmy, uh, nothing surprising in the open. No, we, we thought it was a four horse race from day one and it, it remains that way right now. Uh, Paramus. All four yeah, horses. Are I mean, it, it's right there. It's a, it's a it's a pick out of the hat type of bracket. Wouldn't be surprised if any of the four won it. It's just who's going to play the best that day. Yeah, and uh, Brandon, you got to see Paramus a little bit. Talk about the game before we uh, play the interview with. Uh, oh, Sabella. well, coach. You know, Dan amazingly has his kids week in week out prepared. Offensive line is not big but very, very well sound, you know, very good technique-driven team. They play good sound uh, football. And the kid, and the person that impressed me the most is their quarterback, Tyler Smith. Tyler Smith, when they go any kind of offensive, when they go out to do a little bit of spread, when they do the um, the wildcat, the kid is tough. He's as tough as a quarterback as you'll find in this area. He's been a starting quarterback for three years, and he runs their offense. Coach Sabella allows him to play football, and he's a good functional high school quarterback who understands what he's good at. And Dan Sabella makes sure that he he gets the most out of out of him. And he that's the kid that impressed me the most in that game, not because he is the quarterback, but his overall performance out on the field. Yeah, agreed. And and the sea change uh, around the Paramus program since Dan Sabella got there. I mean. You know, we're talking this year. Last year they fell short in the state final. This year uh, they're one of four good teams left in a bracket. It's hard, you know, Jimmy, you know, think back of what Paramus was before he got there. I mean, it was a revolving door of coaches, and they just couldn't get any traction. And, uh, you know, this week a 35-21 win over a good Nutley team in the opening. No, there's race. no question. I mean, Paramus was a, was a doormat. I mean, not knocking it, but that's what it was. I mean, Dan, he's been to a semifinal, I think, what, seven years in a row? I mean, he's, you know, he's, right. he's, and it's no disrespect to the, to the talent that he has, but they're not the most talented team. They're not the biggest. They're not the fastest. They're not the strongest. But I tell you what, the, the greatest thing we could say about Danny's teams are they just play so hard. And that, that's, that's, yep. you know, that's a credit to him and his coaching staff. Yeah, and they make clutch plays like the field goal that they beat Old Japan with last year in the semifinals. Uh, Brandon caught up with Dan Sabella after the 35-21 win over Nutley. Here's what he said. This is Brandon Gregory from NorthJerseySports.com on the side. Oh, that's what he always says. Coach Dan Sabella after Paramus' 35-21 hard-fought win over Nutley in the first round of the Group 4 of North 1's um, Sex 1 playoffs. Dan, Nutley is a very well-prepared team, very tough, physically well-played, very well-coached team. Um, did they do anything tonight that you weren't prepared for? Uh, no, I don't think so. They're good. Like you said, they're really good at what they do. And, and they were they were uh, tough to prepare for in, in, in really everything they did, including special teams. But, uh, uh, you know, our, our guys hung in there. We battled. Uh, it was it was an even game in the first half. And we made it, we made a couple more plays when we had to in the second half. In the beginning of the game, mentioned the beginning of the game, you know, the first, first couple of drives during the course of the game, both teams scored. Uh, they they seemed to have uh, their team speed. 
your team seem to adjust to their team speed? Was that something that you noticed in the, in the beginning part of the game? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I thought we came out flying uh, offensively and, and uh, you know, kind of let them, you know, then you give up a big run like that and, and momentum turns. So uh, definitely there were some adjustments, especially with their option game. You know, sometimes you gotta you got to settle in a little bit. I thought we did that defensively, and I thought I thought our offensive line and, and our backs, you know, made some plays in the second half. And, and you know, we, anytime you, we, we kind of answered back with our, with our big runs, which was, uh, you know, got the momentum right back. I consider your team some of the best coach teams year in and year out. You, you get the most out of your kids. They they are really tough grinders. Where what what is the most important part to making a good football team in your years of being at Paramus? Well, you know what, uh, this, this 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 team starts with the seniors. We we've, we've got a, a really tight senior class that really cares about each other and believes in playing unselfish football and and, and loves the game. And it starts with the preparation. Uh, uh, this team was, as we said, was tough to prepare for, and our kids worked all week and got it done. But you know what? They, they love each other, and they play for each other, and, and, and I think that's some of the nice compliments you gave them. I think that's what you see when you, when you watch them play. Last question, Dan. Tyler Smith has been your three-year starter at quarterback. You know, when you when you started him your sophomore year, I know you were a little apprehensive, and you were wondering if he was going to be able to handle the rigors of being what you expect from a quarterback after having John Robinson here for a couple years. Where has he gone from his sophomore year to present date time, leading you to the, your next opponent next week, sir? Tyler Smith's a winner. Uh, you know, he comes, he, he, he just, he wants to win. He loves to compete. And uh, it's time we go, it's time we get Tyler Smith and the rest of these seniors a ring. First of all, I want Jimmy to comment. How about Brandon's interviews this week? I mean, it's just, what do you say uh, about he's, that? He's ready to move up the ladder as far as I'm concerned. He is. Or NFL today, some, you know, somewhere. So, uh, you know, great, great question. No doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, Brandon, and to think you're sitting in a car somewhere in a parking lot at Ben Frank Middle School. Freezing my back. Freezing my you-know-what-all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, those are that was good stuff, man. You had you you had their attention and they had yours. So uh, I I really think that those interviews were, were the two best that you've ever done here. Uh, maybe other than the Jerome Swift, Smith one, that uh, the Jerome Smart one that you and I did together. Yeah, we remember how that one turned out. So great stuff there. Uh, quickly on the other side of North One Group Four, uh, as expected, Pascac Valley rolled over Passaic Valley, uh, Old Japan. Well, Demers played much better this time around than they did the first time they played him, but still a 49-19 victory for Old Depan. That sets up one Pascac Valley against number four Old Depan on Friday night, and number three Paramus visits number two Roxbury uh, this weekend as well. And, Jimmy, I know Roxbury has been one of your favorites all year. Give us a quick word. Yeah, um, first, you know, you talk about Roxbury. Roxbury. First of all, it's a tough place to, to play. Uh, Coach Sabella has to take a long trip out to Sakasona for Roxbury. They're coached by Cosmo LaRusso, an outstanding coach. Uh, a wing to the attack. They can run it. They're very physical. They can also throw the ball this year, which adds to the tough stopping them defensively. I think it's going to be a hell of a football game with, with Paramus. I picked Paramus to win the bracket. I think you know, Paramus will find a way to get it done. Yeah, I, I well, I'm rooting for him. I'm rooting for him anyway because uh, we don't cover Roxbury, even though I used to cover Cosmo Larusa. All right, let's move on to another bracket here, and we always get to the parochials last year. We usually go in size order, but let's uh, let's move them up a little bit this week. Let's talk about non-public group four, uh, Paramus Catholic, obviously with the bye, which sets up the rematch <clears throat> rematch with Don Bosco Prep in the one four game this weekend, and Bergen Catholic kept rolling 49-20 over Paul the sixth. St. Peter's Prep took care of business against Seton Hall Prep. So just as we expected, you got the big four in the final four, <clears throat> Paramus Catholic, Don Bosco, Bergen Catholic, St. Peter's Prep, and Richie Ballgame. Uh, Bergen Catholic making another trip. Yeah, to well, Jersey they better City. start a lot faster than they did the last time they played St. Peter's Prep, that's for sure. Okay. I mean, I, I think I think it will be a more competitive game. Uh, you know, Bergen Catholic is definitely playing a little more ball control now. I think they're playing with a lot more confidence now than they did in that game. And, and uh, you know, really the expectations are kind of off of them. You know, they've gotten blown out by prep already. They've, uh, let's face it, you know, with Garrett Tano being hurt, 
they've, they've really exceeded expectations. They've had a couple huge wins. And now they're going with, I mean, as good of a season as, they, as they've had, they still go in with absolutely nothing to lose. All the pressure is on St. Peter's Prep, but, you know, on their home field, uh, you know, having been, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the the younger brother, so to speak, in this section for you know the last uh, seven or eight years, you know this is this is their year. They know that too, and and they know that they can't yeah. they can't start slow and just expect Wimbush to get hot because you never know what happens. I mean, uh, you know, last year in the title game, you got hurt, and then all of a sudden, completely different game. I think uh, uh, prep is going to get out there quick and they're going to have to because if Burton Catholic can gain any traction and any momentum, now all of a sudden, uh, you know, does St. Peter's get tight? And, and, and they haven't really had to experience that with anyone they've played in state so far. Yes. And Jimmy. Private you know, Catholic I, Don Bosco I just kept waiting all season in the last four or five weeks. I've spoken to Brandon numerous times, waiting to see the improvement in Don Bosco. And I, I, I stood home last Friday night. I watched that game against St. Augustine Prep. Obviously, they did not prepare for St. Augustine Prep. They were preparing for Paramus Catholic last week. But I just don't see any improvement in them offensively. And, I, and I'm, I'm kind of bewildered why. Is it the coaching? Is it the quarterback? Is it the offensive line? Is it the injuries? And I just don't see a way that they're going to get better in a matter of four or five days. I think for Amherst Catholic, if they stay clean, if they don't turn the ball over, if they don't get a punt blocked, I think they win again. Yeah, and, and you know – as bad as the loss was that they suffered against St. Joe's, you know, I'm sometimes the loss ain't all bad. You know, real focus is people. You talk, go ahead, Rich. No, no, no. no. Uh, what, uh, what I was going to say is this. Is, again, it's not that they lost. It's how they lost. You know, because coaches can beat into your head all the time. Uh, you know, you, you, you got to stay on your blocks. You know, just some little things that when you hear over and over, sometimes it doesn't, you know, it falls on deaf ears. But after you lose a game like that and just get flat out embarrassed, you know, then your ears start to perk up and you realize, hey, you know, we're fighting for something special here. We've got teams that are coming after us. And if we don't respond to that, we're going to be the ones at the end of the season saying, you know, what if we did this? What if we did that? Yep. All right. We, we can quickly touch on the, uh, the other parochial brackets. I mean, in group one, it's obvious that, St. Joseph Hamilton and uh, St. Mary are on a collision course for the final, and you know it might be a little car wreck at the end. But St. Mary's still undefeated, and they—you they, got to give them credit. They keep plugging away, and they're looking for their shot at St. Joseph Hamilton. I, we we talked about that bracket last week, uh, and I don't think anything has changed. Uh, anything has happened to change our opinion there. We all picked St. Joseph Hamilton to win it. And I should mention the last thing I should mention about non-public group four is that all three of you guys picked St. Peter's Prep. I picked Bergen Catholic. So. There will be a change in the standings one way or the other uh, when we reconvene for next week's show. Uh, Non-public group two, again, nothing has changed. We got DePaul as our uh, local team in there, the number two seed, uh, 50 to nothing over Gloucester Catholic in the opening round there. So, by the way, that's, that's a, that's a winless Gloucester group Catholic three. that was in the playoffs. Continue. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. 50, 50 to nothing. Well, they, for, for a team without a win, they kept it close. They only gave up half a hundred. And uh, non-public group three, again, uh, pretty much chalk there. Del Barton had a bye. They'll play St. John Vianney. Uh, St. Joseph of Montvale. Camden Catholic scored 32 points on them. But, again, Jimmy, that could have been a case of them kind of, you know, little euphoria. And they, yeah, they, they, if you look at the box, they, probably they, should have they been. scored 24 points in the fourth quarter, you know, uh, probably against the, the second team. They're going down to play Red Bank Catholic on Friday. That'll be a competitive game for a while. I see St. Joe's going through that. A little bit shocked by how easy St. John B. Annie, uh beat up Pope John. Uh, Pope John struggling. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be St. Joe's bracket again. No doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, 
It has been for years. Wasn't it Pope John that, that uh, St. Joe's beat last year? It, it was like 15 or something. Or something or apart, or if I remember correctly, I was at the game. Yes, it is. Yeah, it was, was terrible. Yes. All right, let's move on now to the Publix and we'll, uh, what that we haven't touched on yet, starting with uh, North One, Group One. Uh, Brandon, I'm going to go to you first because, you know, you, you're over there, you're shivering. The parochial guys have said their piece over there. So we got Creskill against Booten, Becton against Verona. The top four seeds all advanced. Uh, how about small school fo- small school football from your vantage point? Well, Creskill see that and obviously Becton are the two teams up in this area. And um, like I said, you, the new coach at Creskill, they'll be well prepared to play. And Becton, this is the first time they've been in the bracket, you know, in some time. I think if my memory serves me correct, I did pick Booten. So I'm preparing. I, I think that uh, Crescent will give Bootin a run, and um, Beckton, we'll see. You know, I haven't seen them play, but you know they have a pretty good running back in the boy. I can't say his last name. Flores, I, I would assume. So, you know, Flores. Well, I don't know what they say, and, and you know, we'll see. We'll see. You know, but I, I still think Bootin's the team to beat it at a, a rough one, uh, sexual one. Yeah, I'm and I'll just Verona, remind you, you picked yeah, Verona. I, I, I don't have nothing in front of me. I don't have anything in front of me tonight, Jimmy. so I forget. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy, you, you picked the Bombers, and you even knew something about Booten when you made that pick. So you, Yeah, you I mean, the one there, thing I was there, an outstanding quarterback, Joe Norton, and they were on that wing tee. He was out for about four weeks for a broken wrist on his throwing hand. He's just come back. And they were down 19 to 6 at home against, uh, Hasbro Kites. They fought back into it. They scored on a 95 yard touchdown to take the lead. They held on. I think they're going to beat Creskill this week and Verona. I mean, Verona just dismantled, uh, you know, Compton Lakes after, yeah. after two years in a row being knocked out by them. They have an outstanding quarterback. You know, they do a lot of running with them. Mr. Ferrari, Frankie Ferrari, an outstanding uh, running quarterback. So I, I think it's going to be Verona and Boone in the final. Yeah, and when, Jimmy, when you say a quarterback in the wing tee, it just goes to show you that That's there right. is really no need for a throwing hand. <laughs> All right, moving on now. North one, group two. Uh, you got, again, it's chalk. Waldwick took care of business against North Warren. Paquanic beat Elmwood Park in a great game, 21-20. Richie, had your numbers crunched that one. Uh, Elmwood Park with Michael Dare, the quarterback, they gave Paquanic a scare. One loss. Yeah, uh, they did. I mean, scare uh, let's, Elmwood Park has good skill position players that that are dangerous to get Sean Villamonte in the backfield. Paquanic, though, just, they just keep finding ways to win. And let me tell you something, they're going to give Wald look a run. Yeah. Yeah, because they're they're tough kids and they've played a tough schedule, so they're not going to be overwhelmed. I don't think. I still think Waldwick will have plenty to get it done, but that is that is a tough one for matchup. And you can see it here too in North One Group Two when you're talking about the smaller schools, a little bit more competitive in the opening round. I mean, Lenape Valley, the number three, beat Glenrock forty to thirty five. Uh, Paquonic one by one, and you know Westwood thirty one to six in the two uh, seven game against Pascal Kills was the only one that was really lopsided, you could say. But all that being said, the top four seeds advanced, Waldwick, Paquanic, and Lenape Valley, Westwood. And, Jimmy, you know, it's a storied West Jersey program against a, just a, a North Jersey program. Out yeah, you mentioned, you know, Don Smolian, over 300 wins, seven sectional championships. They struggled against Bergen County teams in the last decade or so with the spread offenses. I mean, Glenrock who, I, you know, was not a great team this year. We saw that the week before against Garfield. You know, they had to intercept a pass in their own end zone to get out of there with a win. You, me- you mentioned Westwood, though. The funny thing is you lose Greg Carmelani, the outstanding, Greg Carmelani, the outstanding quarterback from last year. They go with a two-quarterback system with Zach Hopkins, Colin Saunders, and all they've done this year is combined for 24 touchdown passes and three interceptions. So, you know, Westwood, yeah, not, not bad. I mean, we'll sign up for not that. Bad. Westwood was very methodical last <laughs> week. You know, Pascal Kills, a solid team, made them come out and play, and, and Westwood was just very businesslike, up 31 nothing in the fourth quarter, gave up a late touchdown. 
I think Lenape Valley offensively is solid. I think they're going to have a lot of trouble stopping Westwood. I think we're going to have a Westwood and Waldwick final again. I'd love to see Waldwick against the passing attack of Aquanic. They have an outstanding quarterback and a tight end. That's a Division One tight end. But I think it's going to be the one-two matchup we've been waiting for. I, I agree with you uh, wholeheartedly there. Can I say something uh, real quick about, uh, about Westwood and, and then because yeah, I know you're trying to move on. The one huge advantage that Westwood has, I think, over everyone in the bracket is that they've played every type of game this year. They've played a wide-open game and they've played that grind game. The Richfield Park game was a grind game where they had to play four quarters and they played wide-open games. So that's a huge advantage when you get to this time of the year. You know, like I said, they were methodical, like Jimmy said, methodical against Pascal Kills. So they can win any kind of way. Whatever it takes, Westwood has the ability to win the game. They can win a 17-14 game, 10-6 game, or they can win a 42-35 game. So that's a huge advantage when you have playmakers on both sides of the ball, um, everyone. I agree. I agree with you, real quick, guys. Yep. You talk about them. How about that strength of schedule? Now that you look at what they went through, Richfield Park, a semifinalist, Mawa, a semifinalist, Riverdale, a semifinalist. So Brandon's right. That schedule, even Ramsey. I mean, Ramsey was an outstanding team that just just missed getting yes. into a bracket. They could have done some damage in a bracket, but that schedule has prepared them for just what we're we're waiting for right now. Yeah, good points all. I, I agree. Uh, just I want to make a quick mention of North 2, Group 2. Uh, it's Mountain Lakes, Ridgefield Park, the aforementioned Scarlets. Whatever happens there, it's a great run. They're up against probably the best Group 2 team in the state in undefeated Mountain Lakes. And uh, number three, Lincoln has to visit Madison in that one. But, Richie B., any truth to the rumor will you will be in, in Lincoln Lake Land. Covered cover Mountain Lakes. About two, <laughs> a, a, a town that was a rival to Glen Ridge. Back when I was at the Ridge, uh, still don't like them in any sport. <laughs> uh, no, no, but they, but they, they've had, I mean, going back to the late 80s, as, you know, for like, always great teams, well coached, well disciplined, and when it comes playoff time, they always seem to be playing their best. Uh, Ritual, Ritual Park is interesting because yes. they have, they have the athletes and the size and the ability to hang around with them, um, but, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've got themselves in, in a little bit of trouble, um, you know, with this matchup. I, I just, I just don't know. Again, it's going to come down to, to discipline and who wins the battle up front. Good point. Yep. That, that, and, you know, I mean, Ridgefield Park certainly the decided underdog going up there. All right. The last bracket, North one, group five. Uh, again, there was one, uh, higher seed beating a little, well, w- w- put it this way, I hate that, the higher seed, lower seed, because you say higher seed and it has the lower number. But anyway, number five Hackensack beat number four North Bergen. And Brandon, that stamps Hackensack season as a success. I mean, we've talked about them throughout the course of the year. You know, who have they played? Are they this? Are they that? Well, you know, Whatever. I don't they got to play would play. agree with you there. I think the only way he's going to see success is to bring a championship to a Hackensack. And I think with what he's uh, establishing there, there's potential, if not this year, but sometime in the immediate future. They have to go through Montclair. Montclair has the boy Elijah Robinson, who's committed to a um, Boston College amongst their great athletes that they produce. But the one thing that Montclair has shown uh, has shown this year that they do tend to take teams a little bit for granted. So if Hackensack comes out well prepared, which I know Benji will have the kids. You never know what can happen, you know, because all of a sudden, it's the third quarter, you're in a 10-6 game, things things seem to change and kids do tighten up, and then they realize that they have to play. And I think Pascat Valley showed that early in the year, that they um, that Montclair sometimes doesn't always show up. So let's see uh, this this weekend with Hackens at Mountain versus the Mounties. Yes, so that's one semifinal. And then the other semifinal is Passaic Tech, 40 to nothing winners over West Orange. And uh, Union City laid it on Ridgewood, 54-13. And, Jimmy, you know, Union City's been a Jekyll and Hyde team. 
whichever one is the good one of those. Yeah, they that's finally the showed that, that you know what they could be against. The, let's be honest, the original team that jumped at five and zero, the very favorable schedule, and that caught up with them in the last five weeks of the year. Coach Johnson does play a lot of sophomores, so they'll become better for that. But you know what? Per se, Tech is laying in the weeds. Their only loss against Don Bosco. It would not shock me if they pull the upset this weekend. And I just think Montclair is just too athletic for Akatsak, and they'll find a way to win that. Yes, and I am the only one who picked Union City to win this bracket. What? All three of you guys have Montclair. Watch out so for I PCT. Am, I am definitely nervous. West Orange had a pretty decent year, and PCT just flat out whacked them. Also, they have a two-way player, Drew Lindsay, who is about as underrated as they come in North Jersey and in New Jersey overall. Very good linebacker. You know, I, I, I'm, that's it. I'm ending the show right here. Brandon's interviews, Richie Barton, prepared and well-spoken. Very few ums or you knows. I mean, I, I, I think, really, I'm going to end this show, and then I'm going to send it off to Canton for display in the National uh, National Football League Hall of Fame. Anybody nope. argue, can argue with that? Follow the leader.